We're going to expand on our derivative connections and start discussing what's known as the first derivative test. And basically, we're looking at a very similar situation to all of the previous examples, except in the previous examples, we were given a table of values which involved the derivative, or we were given a graph which involved the derivative or the second derivative. Um, but we were never just given a function in the, uh, as a formula. And when we are given the function as a formula, and we're asked to find out when that function is increasing or decreasing, when that function has a relative max or a relative min, um, when that comes into play, we're going to use something called the first derivative test. All right? and, and the first derivative test is basically just saying, hey, we know that a function is increasing when the derivative of the function is positive. And a function is decreasing when the derivative of the function is negative. And a function has a relative max when the function changes from positive to negative. Excuse me, when the derivative changes from positive to negative. And vice versa, a function has a relative min when the derivative changes from negative to positive. So we're going to use that information. That's basically our first derivative test. But we're going to put some steps together that are going to help us kind of create the picture that we've been so used to seeing in all of the uh, examples from the uh, previous section where we we're looking at how to connect f, f prime and f double prime. Okay, so when it comes to the first derivative test, we're looking at something like this. All right, we've got a function f. This is example number 10 in your notes. We've got a function f, and the derivative of f, f prime, is x times the quantity x plus 4 times the quantity x minus 2 squared. And we are interested in finding, hey, when does the function f have uh, any relative extreme values, if at all? Okay, where do they occur? And the first derivative test allows us to find those values, because we don't know anything about f other than this is f's derivative. But that's all that we really need, because the derivative is the clue to finding those relative extreme values. So what are we going to do? Well, in general, when you're doing the first derivative test, first thing you want to do is find the derivative and set it equal to 0. Well, we've already got the derivative, so now we just need to set it equal to 0. So we have x times x plus 4 times x minus 2 squared, and we want that to be equal to 0. Okay. Now that we've got that, we're going to solve this equation. Because when we solve this, we're finding when the derivative is equal to 0, or does not exist, but this derivative always exists. And those are our critical numbers. And those critical numbers are going to lead us to either a relative max, a relative min, or perhaps neither. Okay. So we need to figure out when this derivative is equal to 0. We've got a product, which is equal to 0, which is good. So we just got to cover them up one at a time and see what values of x cause this statement to be true. Actually, I'm going to cover up two at a time. So let's cover up the first two. We see x minus 2 squared is equal to 0. What value of x makes that statement true? Yeah, exactly. It's 2. So there's one of our critical numbers. x is equal to 2. If we cover up the first and the last, we see that we have x plus 4 is equal to 0. What value of x makes that true? Negative 4. You got it. So negative 4 is also a critical number. And finally, we're going to cover up the second two. And when we do, we see, oh, there we go, a little bit higher, that x is equal to 0. That's our third critical number. Those are our three critical numbers. Those are the three values that we're going to base our answer off of. Okay? So we've got step one done. Step two is done as well. What are we going to do with these critical numbers now? We're going to place them on a number line. You got to be careful because students in the past who have screwed up the order. Make sure when you put these numbers on a number line, the negative 4 is to the far left and 2 is to the far right. Because we have some students that, oops, they put the plus in the wrong spot or something like that. Here we go. All right, so negative 4 on a number line would be over here. 0 would be somewhere over there. And 2 is somewhere over there. It does not need to be drawn to scale. Okay. Now that we have this number line, we're going to pick some test values. Because here's the deal. These are the only three spots where the derivative is equal to 0. Everywhere else, the derivative is either positive or negative. And we know that the derivative can't change from positive to negative unless it crosses over the x-axis when it's equal to 0. So if these are the only three spots that are the derivative is equal to 0, everywhere else, either before negative 4 or between negative 4 and 0, right here, or between 0 and 2, right here, or after 2, in those four spots, everything else is going to be, for values of the derivative, will be positive or negative. We just got to figure out which is which. 
what are we going to do? We test out each of the four intervals. Pick a test value, and we're going to plug it in. Guess what we're going to plug it in? Yeah, the first derivative. Why? Because it's called the first derivative test. Okay, so let's get some test values. I'm going to change colors. I'm going to go over to blue now. Uh, hopefully this is distinguishable from the brown that I'm already using. Uh, we need a number to the left of negative 4. You can pick any number that is smaller than negative 4. I tend to follow the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. All right, and let's just go with negative 5. Okay, number between negative 4 and 0. Again, any number will suffice. If you want to do negative pi, you absolutely can. I'm going to choose negative 1. And I'm going to choose 1 for in between 0 and 2. And finally, I'm going to choose 3 for after 2. So we're going to take these four blue numbers and we're going to test them out. We're going to plug them into the first derivative and we're going to create a plus minus chart. So you have all the steps on your notes uh, in front of you and you're also seeing them right here. But here's the deal. When we plug these four values into the first derivative, we're not interested in the value of the derivative. It doesn't matter if it's negative 7 or negative 12. All that we care about is the sign for when we of the value that we plug it in. Because we know that all of these connections revolve around whether the derivative is positive or negative. So when we're looking at these, testing these derivative values, we're just looking at the sign of the derivative when we plug them in. So let's go ahead and do that. So our first value is negative 5. We're going to take negative 5 and we're going to plug it into the derivative. All right, so let me just erase this up here. All right, if we don't need this anymore. Okay, what happens when we plug negative 5 into the derivative? When I plug negative 5 in for this x right here, I have a negative value. Yes, it's negative 5, but that doesn't really matter, the 5 part. The negative part matters. Okay, when I plug negative 5 in here, negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. That's a negative value as well. Okay, and when I plug negative 5 in here, Negative 5 minus 2 is negative 7, but we're squaring it, and negative times a negative is a positive. So when I plug in negative 5, I end up getting a negative times a negative times a positive. What will that result be, positive or negative? Yeah, it's going to be positive. A negative times a negative times a positive is a positive. And again, here's what's going to happen. No matter what, you may have chosen negative 5, but your neighbor may have chosen negative 12. Well, if they chose negative 12, that would still be negative. Negative 12 plus 4 would still be negative. And because we're squaring, this would still be positive. We would still get a positive result right here. That's why it doesn't matter which test value you pick. As long as you're in the appropriate range, you're good to go. So you can have one test value, your neighbor can have another test value, and you're going to get the same sign, in this case positive. All right, let's move forward. Negative 1. Negative 1 plugged in here would be negative. Negative 1 plus 4, that's 3. That's positive. So I'm going to change that to a positive here. And then I know this is going to be positive because I'm squaring it. What happens when we do a negative times a positive times a positive? Yeah, we get a negative. So a negative right there. Let's go to our next test value. 1. When I plug in 1 right there, it's positive. 1 plus 4 is positive. 1 minus 2 all wrapped and squared is positive. Positive times a positive times a positive is a positive. And the same thing's going to happen when we plug in 3. I put a 3 here, I get a positive value. 3 plus 4 is 7, that's positive. 3 minus 2 is 1 squared, that's positive. Positive times positive times positive means we have a positive value there. So there's our plus minus chart. This is the first part of step 4. Okay, we've created the plus minus chart and now we need to draw our conclusions. We go back to the stem of the question, and the question asks, what's going on with the relative extreme values here? Well, now we know. Here are our critical numbers, negative 4, 0, and 2. What's happening at negative 4? Well, the derivative changes from positive to negative. Well, we know from our connections that when the derivative changes from positive to negative, we have a relative max. What's going on at 0? Well, the derivative was negative, and then at zero, the derivative changed to positive. Again, from those connections that we've memorized and we've used, that means that the function has a min, a relative min at x equals zero. And then finally at two, the derivative was positive beforehand and positive afterwards. So there's no change in sign. 
So nothing's happening here. This is neither a max nor a min. All right. So we've drawn our conclusions. Now we've got to write a supporting statement. On the exam, it's not good enough to just have a plus minus chart. That's not justification. You have to state your conclusions and the reason why. So our first conclusion is that f has a relative max at x equals negative 4. So let's put that down. All right, f has a relative max at x equals negative 4 because, and remember it's the three dots for because, because f prime changes. And how did it change? It changed from positive to negative. So we have to write that statement down. From positive to negative. Okay, there's one conclusion. And then the next conclusion was that we had a relative min at x equals 0. So we also have f has, and I'm going to abbreviate a little bit here, has a relative min at x equals 0 because f prime changes from negative to positive. Okay, now those statements that we've written here, they verify all the work that we've done. We've used the first derivative test to solve the problem.